have you been observing what the Bears have done this offseason? Are you in touch with your protege and friend, Matt Eberflus, these days? I kind of watch a little bit from a distance here and there. I do talk to Matt a lot, though. And, uh, you know, you have to keep everything a little bit under undercover when you're uh, dealing this part of the year, what you're doing, how you're getting them, all those things. But I know he feels real good about the direction and uh, what they've been able to uh, pick up so far in this off season. Well, it, I know we said we want to talk about three technique and we will, but I got to ask you about the yeah. linebackers. I mean, they signed Tremaine oh, Edmonds God. and TJ Edwards to be their Erlacher and their Briggs essentially. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, I wonder if you ever thought of Erlacher and Briggs as like positionless where like both of them had similar responsibilities. Cause the way they've talked about this, if one is the Mike, the middle and one is the will, the weak side, but they'll kind of both go back in coverage a lot. It yeah. seems in this defense. Oh yeah. And, uh, you know, each, there is a skill set for both those positions and, uh, you get better at doing the same things over and over, obviously. But those two guys they've gotten, man, I mean, you talk about perfect fits. And they've done it. And they played at a high level, just like Brian and uh, and Briggs did. But uh, you talk about a great fit, it's beautiful. And so I'm, I'm really excited about that part. So so maybe not positionless. Maybe I'm wrong about that. And the question, uh, is, 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 is Tremaine Edmonds a really good fit as, as the Mike? And why, do you think? You know, I think it's one, you got to have great, great instincts inside because in cover two, well, you cannot bite up on the run. We call it slow to you know. You guys got to sit there and uh, you're playing, you know, seven guys in comfort coverage. And so he takes great discipline, experience, and he comes from somewhat of the system. I, he came from Buffalo, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, which, you know, that was. They've done a lot of what we've done there over the years, Leslie Frazier and some of those. And uh, the instincts, and then to have the ability and the range and the athleticism to run through the middle, middle of the field. I mean, you end up like a free safety just about. So it, it is, uh, and a guy has got to be able to tackle great in space and have great instincts for the run and ball skills. Ball skills are everything. That's where you, where you have a chance to really tip a game with ball skills. Rod, I need a little bit of a history lesson when it comes sure. to this defense and going back. And I'm not sure if it was it was Monty Kiffin or or how some of this got created. We know what the prototypes are for three technique and like you're saying for the Mike Backer mm -hmm. and and for the 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 corners with a classic cover two corner. Was this because of skill sets of certain players? And we said, well, wait a second. We can line this guy up on the outside shoulder of the guard because he's quick and decisive and disruptive and he can get upfield. Or was this defense created on paper and then you went to find the types of athletes who could fit these roles? Uh, that's a terrific question. And it really goes back even further. It goes back to Chuck Noll at the Steelers. And uh, that's what Coach Dungey was involved with it at that point. And, you know, there's tweaks here, tweaks there. But it kind of all started everything. And then he brought it with the Minnesota Vikings. Him and Monty Kiffin were there um, with the Vikings they had. That's where Randall and uh, Dolman and some of those guys were there, uh, Del Rio. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were dominant on defense. And uh, then Coach came to uh, – Tampa, and uh, that's when we we felt we had guys in place on that on the roster that could, if we put them in the right positions, they could be really successful. Because Brooks was going into his second year, he he was okay. The he's kind of sandbacker. We moved him to Will. John Lynch was kind of an outside backer. We moved him to safety, and Warren was you know struggling a little bit his first year, and and then it kind of really kicked off. But if I can say one thing about the system, Tampa 2, it's you got to major in simplicity and can't be scared as a coach because it's on the position coach big time. That player reflects the coach that he's being coached under. That's the pressure that comes to it. Player, coach, reflect each other. And this game is built on uh, tedious repetitions of the simplest movement 
over and over and over. And when they get that, and there's clarity in the word why, why we do something, explain very well. When there's clarity to what you're doing, your speed increases. Your hustle, your effort, your hitting, everything increases. But when you add maybe too much, then you take away the instincts of the player. Now, if you go that way, that's fine. I mean, everybody. But this is, I'm just telling you how we learned it and came up. Mm -hmm. It's about what you do, not how you, it's about how you do things, how you do it. So, and drill work and those things. Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, 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 no. I, I, I didn't mean to interrupt you. It's fascinating to think about the defensive line coach working with the defensive tackles. And we think of the three technique, which we're obsessed with here in this town. We, we, yeah. we miss Tommy Harris. Uh, we wish oh, yeah. we had Warren Sapp. Um, we it was, it, it, and we're trying to find one. We're questioning whether Jalen Carter is worth taking a, a, a risk on as a person. And we'll, we'll trust the bears brass to make that call after they meet with him and, and kind of yeah. talk to him. But it, but it's so important. What is it? What are some of the simple things that the defensive line coach drills into whoever is the three technique? What are some of the simple yeah. movements that have to be repeated again and again? And I'll, I'll give you the what the uh, position really is called. Okay, this is it's great. And everybody calls three techniques. In our system, it was the under tackle. And expectations go up with that word. And because you know, it used to be all under fronts. So you had to under tackle away from the call, away from the tight end. And then we got into more over fronts, but we still use the term under tackle because he has to dominate the game. We put that mantle on him, and you've got to make sure that you're up. It was like Henry Melton was. He had a terrific year. Well, my last year, oh, my God, all, all pro. And he was at one time a uh, running back out of Texas and uh, then moved outside back for a senior year, and we moved him under tackle because of his movement. So they come in all different ways, all different looks. And But what you do is you try to give them the same set of keys, reads, keys. And I, I, best, I best thing I can say to you is this. If there's a stimulus, there has to be a response. The coach's job is to cut the time of the response down. Now, if you're having to say, hey, look, it, they may run over here, they could do that. Hey, watch for the screen. Watch for this. Your, your uh, instincts slow down. Your ability to react starts slowing down. So you just rep the keys, and it can be hard on the player and the coach because you're going to do the same things every day. And we're not there to uh, make them happy, and we're certainly not there to entertain. It's there to do the work that's required. The foot, every step matters. Every step matters. Where your eyes are matters. Your mindset matters. And then, and then you develop the standards for these men, which they're doing there, and then you you got to cut it loose. But you've got to be able to find that internal motor of a man that's dying to play that position. Oof. It's not for everybody. Man, Rod Marinelli, you are coaching us. And I'm ready to run through a damn wall. Right <laughs> I know now. you are. Dan, Dan, Dan Bernstein is getting hot and bothered by the coaching talk right here. Coach, let's go. Let's go. <laughs> but seriously, like, so the motor of the man and, like, you know, teach, coaching is to make the response closer to the stimulus. Cause yeah, you see that yeah. center move and then you got to get under, or you see that guard move yeah. and you got to get under as an under yeah. tackle. Mm -hmm. So God, and now you're talking about Henry Melton who wasn't this position, but you saw it in him. So now you got me oh, thinking, yeah. now you got me thinking about Lucas Van Ness out of Iowa, yeah. you know, or, or like one of these guys who it's undeniable. They have the motor. Maybe they haven't learned the technique for the position, but if you see yeah. the motor, maybe you go get the guy to do it. Is that Would that be your inclination, to find the heart and the motor first and then teach the guy the technique? Yes, you've got to find that, that love and that passion. And then he's always, obviously he's got to have some skill, you know, the movement, the feet, the balance. Those things have got to be involved in it. But then once you feel those things and he's willing to be coached, and coached hard every day. 
every day. There's no there's no day off, none. And you just burn it into these guys. And then, boy, I mean, you get something special. And uh, and then those linebackers, man, now they can play ball. I mean, they can, they know the ball is going to come out on time. You want to get the sacks, of course, but you also want to make sure that ball is getting pumped out on time. Or if he holds it just a little bit, that's when you get him. But throw it a little bit quicker than he wants to. That's when the defense starts breaking on the ball, and that's when you get the big hits. That's when you get the takeaways. We're talking with NFL coaching legend Rod Marinelli here on the Parkins and Spiegel Show. Dan Bernstein in for Danny Parkins. And I'm curious, Rod, as quickly and as noticeably as football can evolve, I'm wondering how the responsibilities of the under-tackle position have evolved concurrently, whether it's the the use of the U-tight end or the use of the Mm -hmm. RPO game and packaged plays in that regard. Guard. How is how is the position different in in this modern game maybe than it used to be? I think this is when you try to adjust that, you take away some of its instincts. The keys are the keys. You know, it doesn't matter. You, you could talk to all those old camper guys, you know, Brian Urlacher. What would you do? Well, I'm going to read my keys so I can play fast, and it's going to tell me where the ball is going, and where I should be, and what position I should be in. Can I give you a really good illustration of that? What yeah. I'm talking, it'll kind of yes, illuminate to you. Yes, sir, please. If, when you train a, a lion in a cage and you walk in as a lion tamer, you bring three things in, a whip, a stool, and a pistol. Which do you think would be more effective? I think you're going to say the stool to be yes. to get him comfortable yes. and be calm with him, that kind of thing. Yes. Well, when you turn a stool over, there's four prongs, Ooh. right? You know, the four, what do you call it, legs on it. And it sees that. But when a lion hunts in the open, it only picks one thing. It doesn't pick four. It locks in on one thing, and it goes fast, and it eats. But when a stool comes, he sees four things, and it makes him – lose the instincts a little bit of which one to attack. Ah. It slows him down a little bit. And that's what too much defense, in my opinion, too much defense can do to a player at times, makes him confused, makes him a little docile, and if he's not on it, he's not using his athletic ability and his ability to explode. Mm. If I remember... No, go ahead. uh I said, if I remember correctly, Coach... You used to edit together film of animals in the wild to show players, whether it was the defensive line. Is there is there any anything you would splice in specifically for to motivate a three technique? Oh, I'd have all kinds of stuff. And one thing I learned, it it wasn't for entertainment. I'd always tell them there was a message. But when you learn teaching and learning. You, you modify the environment at times to make learning fun. And they'd love it. But I would try to find certain things, hat in a crack, uh, a bull hitting something like that or whatever, that that technique is what we're going to be able to see this week. And we've got to be able to do this on the double team. Or it could be a, a, a giraffe running through the middle of the field to pick a ball off like or, like, or whatever. Hmm. But you see those images, and what you do, when you don't have a lot of defenses, you can really be good at teaching one defense in creative ways. And that's always been what I've, I've believed. And now people believe, yeah, I take my hat off to everybody. You know, a lot, do a lot, and it's football. But it's, you can do a lot of things different ways, but mm-hmm. with me, it's one way. It's, it's such good stuff uh, from you, Rod Marinelli. So we've been talking to draft experts. The other day we talked to one who said that he thinks there's only like three guys who profile as real good three techniques in this draft. Yeah. You can't scout it. Like if you're an amateur like us, they don't list it like that because these guys have to be found and, and kind of kind of made. I'm curious. I'm looking at a couple of prospects now. I don't have to tell you the names even right right now. But like 
I, you know, what should I look at? Do I look at the the three cone drill? Do I look at the height and weight? Like if I told you this, one guy is 6'1", 281. And the other guy is 6'5", 272. Is there an yeah. advantage to being 6'5", or 6'1", for these two players at that position? Well, here's the thing you should look at uh, for you to have fun, you know, as you and I, the questions you ask guys are great because you want to improve at your job. Yes. That's, I admire that. I always admire that. And so I'm a, you, all those things you watch at the combine for a defensive lineman don't fit a lot. Hmm. Now, the one that really fits is a standing broad jump. Wow. And you can't cheat. And your hips are there. You can practice this. For a hundred years, you may gain an inch, and because it's it's you got the power or not, you want to feel the hip snap, and the good ones can jump. That's that explosive hip power you need for that position, and why I would say some of the other drills aren't as good for a defensive lineman. See, when you run a forty, we always go off on movement not on the starter gun or on your own. Mm. And that's a skill. Gotcha. And well, mm. the ones that are really good, Tommy Harris and Warren Sapp, oh, man, they come, they could feel it. They, they, they had the instincts and hardly ever jumped offside. They didn't guess because guessing hurts your team. And there's all penalties. But those guys, so that, you never see that. And then when they have these redirectional drills, yeah. they already know where they're going. So it takes the stimulus response away. Does that make sense? It sure does. No, it, it, yeah. it very much does. So I was looking at Lucas Van Ness, and then I was looking at this kid, Kalijah Cansey, who was, is at Pitt, and he's smaller than Aaron Donald, but not by much, and he's supposedly yeah. really crazy fast. You familiar with that, with that guy at all? Uh, I've heard the name stuff. Okay. And I apologize. I'm I'm not. That's okay. I've been I've been, I've been goofing off. But, <laughs> I'm sorry, but I know what you're saying. I've heard he's an undersized guy, about two eighty eight, maybe. Yeah, six yeah. One. and and yeah. only six one. You know. Yeah. So I just uh, I look back and I see uh, some guys. So you you got to have models over over the curve. This is fun for you. Go back and look at them. But you know, Warren was maybe right above. Six one. He might have six two. Um, Anthony McFarland, Vogel McFarland was with me there, and he was might have been six foot. Hmm. And you know he was two eighty, two eighty five coming out, something like that. But they can run, and and not just run, redirect and balance. You want to see balance in these guys. I would chart for myself two things when I'd watch film for me. I chart how many times they're on the ground in the game. I want to see how many times. Hmm. Now, was it a poor block uh, block protection, or was it a guy stumbling, tripping over his feet? You know, I just wanted to see that. And the last thing I always would love to do, I start with the fourth quarter first, and I want to see how they play in the fourth quarter. Oh, that would tell me their pride, it tell me their conditioning, and it tell me their competitiveness. 